American Tribes for Siletz Indians, and he led the fish monitoring part of this project. So I'll be talking about some of his results. And then Scott Bailey was formerly with um, Tillamook Estuaries Partnership. He has since moved on to another position, but he was pretty integral in collecting a lot of this data and also um, helping to manage the, the NOAA grant that funded a lot of this post-restoration work. I think you guys can see my little control thing here, and I don't know how to get rid of that. Hmm. Hopefully that's not too annoying, having that on the bottom. Let's see. Um, so we care about tidal wetlands, um, such as salt marshes and, and other coastal ecosystems for a lot of reasons. They have a lot of value in the coastal zone. So they provide habitat for and food for wildlife. Uh, they support um, a range of biodiversity. Um, some species are unique and can only live in estuaries um, or, or tidal wetlands. Tidal wetlands are important in wave and storm attenuation. Um, we saw this um, actually in a very dramatic fashion in 2014 in Indonesia. Um, there was a huge um, tidal wave that inundated the, the shoreline and places that had high mangrove and wetland cover um, suffered a lot less damage than areas that had been extensively Can you guys hear me fine? Okay, great. Um, wetlands are also important in terms of their nutrient uptake. Um, they can help purify coastal watersheds. Uh, tidal wetlands that are vegetated promote soil accretion, and they're important areas in terms of their productivity and, and actually carbon sequestration. And this is an important function that people are thinking a lot more about as we think about how wetlands could be important for mitigating the effects of climate change. Unfortunately, we've lost a large percent of, percentage of our tidal wetlands um, along the Pacific coast, as well as other parts of the country. Um, there are various estimates depending on your geographic region, but on the outer coast from Northern California to Washington, it's been estimated that we've lost about 67 or 68% of our tidal wetlands. And one habitat type that's been particularly impacted are tidal forested wetlands. These are kind of unique ecosystems that we have um, in the Pacific Northwest, in Oregon, Washington, and British Columbia. These are areas where Sitka spruce and other woody plants can actually grow down into the estuary, and they can tolerate um, a fair amount of inundation as well as uh, brackish salinities. And unfortunately, um, we've lost a very high percentage of these forested tidal wetlands, but these used to be fairly common along the Pacific Northwest coast. So one of the um, uh, goals of um, uh, coastal practitioners and conservationists um, is to restore these areas where possible. And restoration can re reverse the historical trends that we've seen with coastal wetland loss throughout the region. Wetland restoration can have a variety of different goals. So one goal might be to increase wetland area and reduce habitat fragmentation so that species don't have to move between these isolated fragments, but have a more contiguous um, set of habitats. Another goal of restoration can be to enhance the different ecosystem processes and functions in estuaries and provide more services that are uh, beneficial to coastal communities. In the Pacific nor Northwest, a lot of the projects that have been implemented are usually done by removing dikes or levees that surround these wetlands and that have altered the hydrology substantially of these areas. So um, as Alex mentioned, um, we'll be talking today about the Southern Flow Corridor Project or SFC, as I'll mention in the talk. And this project was a cooperative project among a variety of regional stakeholders um, in, the, in the Tillamook County region. Uh, the project really has a long history because it grew out of um, a number of attempts to sort of plan for restoration in the SFC area. And the recognition that um, the town of Tillamook was having um, urban flooding problems quite a bit. So the, I, one of the main motivations for the project was to implement this and see if um, uh, the damaging impacts of high tide flooding could be reduced um, in urban areas. 
Some secondary benefits of the project included um, increasing the amount of available salmonid habitat and potentially enhancing um, carbon sequestration in these tidal wetlands. And SFC is one of the largest restoration projects uh, to date in the Pacific Northwest. Uh, there's a very large project in um, uh, Southern uh, Oregon and the Bandon project. And then there's um, a large one in uh, Nisqually up in the Puget Sound um, area. Uh, these um, are also very large projects kind of on the scale of um, the SFC project. So this map here shows the location of the project um, in Tillamook Bay. Um, so it's in the southern part of Tillamook Bay and SFC is um, highlighted here in these green shades. Um, so it is located at the confluence of three of the major rivers that flow into Tillamook Bay, the Tillamook River, the Trask, and then the Wilson River to the north. Um, the project was implemented in 2016 to 2017. So in 2016, um, the dike was removed and then several tide gates um, that surrounded the property uh, were removed. Uh, another part of the project was the construction of a setback dike. And so that setback dike um, was located here, kind of on the eastern edge of the project. Um, that was implemented so it could protect some of the um, properties in the area that were not were outside of the restored wetland area. And a number of new tidal channels through the wetland were excavated. Um, some of these uh, aligned with historic tidal channels that um, folks believed existed up until about the 1930s. And then others were sort of small uh, connecting channels. And um, as Alex mentioned, the construction continued for about two years and ended in uh, 2017. So one of the interesting things about the SFC site um, is that it's large and because it was so large it had a very a very heterogeneous set of um, pre-restoration land use and land types. So we divided this site into a couple of different zones so that we could uh, look at the um, land use land cover differences and how that might affect restoration. So I'll just describe these really briefly. And the north side of the project, we call this the north zone. This is an area that um, is a mix of emergent marsh and woody wetlands. So there's some Sitka spruce there. There were other uh, woody plants as well. This is, tends to be a fresher and higher elevation part of the project site. Below that, we had the mid zone here. Um, this is an area that was mainly freshwater, um, non-tidal emergent marsh prior to restoration. There was a, uh, some agricultural activities here in the past, but um, not really very many in, in the last couple of decades. South of that, along the, um, the river here, we have the crop zone. So this was an area that was um, fairly actively in agricultural production um, right up until the time of restoration. So this was a, a relatively highly disturbed part of SFC. Over here, we have this little um, parcel that we called the South Zone. This is an area It had actually um, had some degree of restoration prior um, to the implementation of this, this larger project. So it had some kind of freshwater plantings and, and so forth. And then this last zone here, kind of to the southeast, is what we call the gray zone or GR. So this is an area that, were, that was actively grazed by cattle uh, just prior to the restoration. So our research objectives um, were, we had a lot of people involved in this project from a number of different institutions. So we had kind of a wide range of research objectives. We wanted to assess whether nuisance flooding um, decreased in the town of Tillamook with the implementation of the project. We wanted to quantify that hydrologic change. So how did channels and groundwater hydrology change before and after the project was implemented? We wanted to study um, soil accretion rates and changes in soil properties. We wanted to look at greenhouse gas emissions. Um, so what, how is this project doing in terms of carbon dioxide and methane? And does the project have carbon sequestration potential? We wanted to look at mosquito abundance before and after the project. And this was um, motivated by the fact that um, one of the large projects in Bandon, Oregon actually had 
quite a bad mosquito problem right after the implementation of the project. So we wanted to make sure that that wasn't going to occur at SFC. We wanted to look at plant succession. This is the base of the food chain for these tidal wetlands. And then we wanted to determine fish abundance and habitat use. This is a broad suite of research objectives and um, don't have time for all this today. So in the rest of the talk, I'm really going to focus on um, how the soils, groundwater, vegetation, and fish communities changed. And there were other um, project um, partners that were involved in measuring these other, other things at SFC. So our, the overall research question I'd like to address today is how did hydrology, soils, and biological communities change at SFC following restoration? And we had a couple of hypotheses because we had this really big site with heterogeneous, uh, a heterogeneous landscape, we wanted to look at a couple of uh, research hypotheses. So one was that we um, hypothesized that initial ecosystem conditions and early recovery following restoration would be linked to those differences in land cover and land use. So we would see uh, development of the site that differed among these different zones. One idea we had is that the more heavily managed areas, so the cropped and gray zones, they had the highest human impact, uh, that they would differ more from reference wetland conditions uh, than some of the freshwater pasture sites. And then our second hypothesis is that within SFC, the rate of uh, early recovery of the ecosystem would be correlated with wetland elevation. So in other words, uh, lower elevation areas um, would uh, essentially change and develop more rapidly than higher elevation areas. And I'll, sh I'll show data that, um, that supports that. So we monitored a, a wide range of parameters. Again, I won't talk about all of these today, but for hydrology and water quality, we looked at water level, salinity and temperature in channels, as well as the groundwater. We assessed um, flooding at high tide. For wetland geoform, we looked at wetland elevation, rates of uh, sediment accretion or soil accretion, and channel morphology. We looked at the composition of the soils, their salinity, pH, and organic matter content. And then for biological communities, we looked at plant cover, including native and non-native species, the kinds of species that were there, fish abundance and their fish behavior, invertebrates um, in the soils, and mosquito abundance. And then for processes, we measured uh, greenhouse gas emissions. So our overall sampling approach is, is what's known um, in the statistical literature as a uh, before-after um, control impact design, or BACI for short. And that simply means that you monitor um, your impact site. In our case, that's SFC. You monitor that before the restoration and you monitor it after the restoration. And then you also monitor reference wetlands that are not impacted by the restoration before and after uh, restoration. So that's what this little schematic on the right kind of shows. You have um, an ecosystem state. This could be any of your variables. It could be plant cover or fish abundance. And so you monitor what goes on in the ref reference wetlands. And then you monitor what goes on in your, your former tidal wetland um, up till the point of restoration. Um, and then at that point, your restored wetland will either kind of gradually approach the reference conditions or it may do something else. And so this trajectory is what we're interested in, in really assessing. Our pre-restoration sampling occurred um, between 2013 and 2015, mostly in, in 2014. And then our post-restoration sampling occurred between 2017 and then um, a little bit earlier this year in 2020. These are some examples of the reference wetlands that we used in this study. We used two types of re reference wetlands. We looked at high marshes and, and that'll be denoted by HM in, in the upcoming slides. And we looked at low marshes or LM. And these are two different um, marshes. These low marshes are flooded much more frequently and they tend to have different species. And these high marshes are flooded less frequently. They're higher in elevation. But these are sort of the best, least disturbed examples of tidal wetlands that we have on the Oregon coast. So we looked at two high marshes and two low marshes for reference wetlands. 
Um, the first one here is Goose Point. This is a little bit farther north um, up by Bay City. This is a, a very nice pristine um, high marsh habitat. Our other high marsh habitat was down here just south of the project on Dry Stocking Island. And then we had two low marshes. We had this kind of uh, western edge of Dry Stocking Island and this um, area here that we called Bay Marsh. So these were the two low marshes that we compared the project to. Okay, so now I'll go into some of the um, parameters. Um, I'll, for each parameter, I'll kind of give you an introduction of the methods we used and then kind of an overview of the results. Um, and the first uh, parameter we wanted to look at was wetland surface elevation and soil accretion. So to measure wetland surface elevation, we used um, an instrument here pictured um, here on the right. This is called an RTK GPS. So this is a very high precision GPS that allows us to measure both horizontal and vertical um, positions to with about an inch um, when it's operating well. So we can get really um, detailed information on the exact elevation of the, of the wetland surface. We took all the data that were, were collected from this instrument and we put that into a metric here. Now this is a little bit of math, um, which is sometimes hard in the evening, but um, this metric here, Z star, just sort of scales where you are um, at the, on the wetland surface to the overall tide range. So Z is your, um, your surface elevation measurement. Um, MTL is mean tide level of your estuary and MHHW is your mean higher high water in your estuary. So just to kind of keep track of what Z star means, if, if you have Z star equal to zero, then you're at mean tide level. So you're gonna be flooded about 50% of the time. And when Z star is equal to one, you're at mean higher high water. So there you're only gonna be flooded maybe eight to 5% of the time, not very often. Just to keep things simple, we kind of classify anything below one as low marsh and anything above one as high marsh. Now to measure um, soil accretion rates, we used a, a fun method called um, feldspar marker horizon plots. So you can see the feldspar here on the right. It's basically a white clay, it's not, it's not toxic, but you deposit the white clay right on the sediment surface um, and then you're done. Then you just wait and sediment eventually uh, gets deposited over that surface. And then you wait some no, uh, amount of time and you collect a, a core there and you can see that that feldspar layer is still present years later. And you just measure the amount of soil that has uh, accreted over that layer um, over time. So we established feldspar marker horizon plots in 2013. Um, and then we sampled them in 2018. Um, and then because we lost some of them, they, they weren't, um, didn't really render the data we were looking for, we established a whole nother set in 2018. So these can continue to be monitored. So these are the results. Uh, first, I'll show you the re results for wetland surface elevation. So again, on the y-axis here, I have Z star. And again, um, a Z star of zero, this is mean tide level and a Z star of one is um, mean higher high water. So, um, and I'll use this color scheme kind of throughout a number of these figures, but the green bars are our reference marshes and the blue bars are different zones at SFC. So our low marsh was below 1.0 as expected. That's our reference low marsh. And our reference high marsh was above 1.0. So quite a bit higher. Um, this is the pre-restoration condition in 2014 and essentially the same elevations in 2018 after restoration. The different zones at SFC, you can see that there was really a range of elevations. So the north zone, um, this is the one, the zone that was partially woody in vegetation and the gray zone, these two were the highest elevation zones at SFC. But these other areas, the middle, south, and the cropped, this agricultural zone, these were the lowest elevation areas. We found in 2018 that um, the pattern of elevation differences were fairly similar. So there probably was a little bit of change going on after um, 
restoration, but typically it would take decades for the elevation of these areas to increase considerably. These are the results for the sediment accretion and um, two sets of, of data are shown here. On the left is the rates that we calculated between 2013 and 2018. And then on the right are the rates between 2018 and 2020. Um, the y-axis on both figures is the soil accretion rate. So this is measured as millimeters per year of soil that came in over that white marker horizon. Um, there were differences between our reference sites. So low marsh um, tended to have a higher accretion rate than high marsh. This is not uh, surprising because this has been found in other studies in estuaries along the west coast. But it was interesting to find that SFC actually had um, substantially higher accretion rates. So particularly this crop zone, which was fairly low in elevation, it had a several fold greater accretion rate than our reference wetlands. Interestingly, when we went back um, just actually just a few months ago now and, and sampled these plots again, we found that the low and high marsh rates were fairly similar, but generally we found that the um, SFC accretion rates had declined. So some of this might be explained by the fact that in the year or two right after restoration, there was a lot of sediment moving around on the site because of construction activities, and uh, that might reflect these really high rates. And then as time goes on, these rates may um, uh, start to look more like our reference low marsh rates. I should mention too that uh, virtually all of these rates are higher than local sea level rise rates for the Oregon coast. So though um, sea level rise rates uh, would tend to be about um, in the range of two to three millimeters per year. So virtually all these rates are higher and that, that's good news for the sustainability of these wetlands with sea level rise. Um, these, the sediment accretion um, rates that we saw also tended to be not completely so, but tended to be correlated with wetland elevation. So that's what I've shown here. These are um, in these top panels, these are the SFC um, plots. And then in the bottom panel, or excuse me, these are the reference plots in the top two panels, and then the SFC plots in the bottom two panels. And we tended to see this negative relationship. So if you were um, higher up in the time frame, you weren't getting uh, inundated quite as much, and your soil accretion rates tended to be lower. Another thing we looked at were the was the composition of the surface soils. So what were they like before restoration and what were they like afterwards, um, as well as the groundwater. And groundwater is a really important component of these ecosystems. It's not actually measured all that often in Pacific Coast tidal wetlands. Um, and I definitely thank Laura Brophy for kind of inspiring me years ago to, to really look at the groundwater more carefully because it's an interesting and important parameter. To measure groundwater, what we did is we sunk these small PVC wells into the ground. They go down a little bit more than a meter into the ground. And then we put little water sensors, um, pressure sensors inside those wells at the bottom. So they measure the water level as it fluctuates up and down. Um, we collected data every 15 minutes. So we have thousands of data points on the, the water level at these locations. And we focused on two periods. We looked at the wet season, so kind of December to March and then the dry season, June to September. And I know Oregon still gets rain in the June, but we called, the, <laughs> we called this the dry season. For the near surface soil um, samples, we collected those at all of the accretion plots that I just talked about where the feldspar layers were put down. And we looked at three parameters, soil um, conductivity or salinity, pH, and then the percent of carbon or percent organic matter uh, in the soils. So I'll first show you the results for the groundwater level. And these plots are a little bit complicated here, but I'll try to walk you through these. I'm just showing a couple of, of our sites. We had nine groundwater wells, but I'm just showing three here. And this one on the left, this is an example of a high marsh reference groundwater well, and then two of our SFC. So a low elevation station and then a mid elevation station at SFC. And the data are divided by wet and dry season. So wet season here on the top and dry season below. 
And these plots are what are known as violin plots. So they show the distribution of groundwater through the whole season that we measured it. And the way to interpret the violin plots, if you haven't seen these kinds of graphs before, is that wherever the violin is um, fat or wide, that's where the majority of your data points are falling. So for example, at this high marsh reference station during the wet season, uh, most, of the, um, most of the time the groundwater was just below the surface. So it was about um, maybe up to the surface to maybe about 20 to 30 centimeters below the surface. In um, the dry season here, um, during both pre and post restoration periods, um, the groundwater actually dropped a little. So the groundwater um, is lower during, during the dry season. This, this definitely makes sense for the reference wetlands. Now SFC sh showed some really interesting patterns. So these two representative stations here are actually very different. Um, this station here that we called 16, during the wet season, the groundwater was essentially always at or even above the wetland surface. So this was a highly saturated area. But this other site um, at um, 773, which was um, at a higher, eleva higher elevation, it actually had really low water levels. So the water table was about two feet or more below the surface during the wet season. And then in the dry season, we saw some dramatic changes. So um, at these two SFC stations, uh, during the dry season, the groundwater was very, very low before restoration. And then once the site was restored to tidal influence, the groundwater um, increased dramatically, especially here at this station where it essentially became saturated right at the surface. So for uh, soil salinity, we saw uh, also a pretty big impact of the restoration on uh, soil salinity conditions. So just prior to restoration, the soils at, um, at the Southern Flow Corridor site were very fresh. They were essentially um, a half a part per thousand or less. So they had um, very, uh, very little salt in them at all. But our reference marshes, our low and high reference marshes, those were in the mesohaline um, range. So they tended to have salinities of um, maybe eight to 12 parts per thousand. Following restoration though, um, salinity increased fairly dramatically at SFC. Um, and this is what that, uh, this first figure kind of shows. So this is the mean change in salinity in parts per thousand um, at each of these zones. Um, and it also includes these error bars, which are 95% confidence intervals. So a change of zero means that the, the habitat really didn't change much pre to post restoration. And that's kind of what we saw here in the reference wetlands. They maybe got a tiny bit saltier, but uh, really didn't change. These zones at SFC, however, um, increased anywhere from about five to 11 parts per thousand in the soil. So just within two years, the, the soils at these, um, in these different zones at F SFC had become quite a bit more saline. And just like we saw an elevation effect on soil accretion rates, there was actually a strong correlation between wetland elevation and salinity change. So um, parts of the wetland, that were at parts of SFC that were higher in elevation um, tended to not become quite as salty, whereas lower elevation areas um, became uh, even, more, even more salty after restoration. We kind of saw a similar pattern with pH. So pH just measures the acidity of the soil or how acid, acidic or basic it is. And prior to restoration, um, pH generally was higher in reference wetlands than it was at SFC. After restoration, pH did tend to increase in most of the zones that we monitored within SFC. So this is a similar figure here. This is just the change in pH between post, pre and post re uh, restoration monitoring periods. And again, the reference wetlands didn't uh, change all that much. And then these two zones, the north and south zone also didn't change all that much. But uh, the middle zone and the crop zone, these tended to be, um, become uh, more basic, uh, had a higher pH over time. And remember that pH is a log scale. So this increase is not an increase of one, but actually an increase of uh, tenfold uh, in the pH of these soils. So pretty, pretty large change due to the restoration. And just like salinity, we found that there was a relationship between the amount of change in pH 
um, and the, the wetland elevation. We also assessed uh, an, a vegetation um, in these uh, wetlands, and I'm more of a vegetation and algal ecologist by training, so this is probably the most fun part of the project for me. Um, we looked at percent cover of different plant species in one meter squared plots. Um, we looked at many, many dozen plots, both within SFC um, as well as the two types of reference wetlands. And we looked at several different plant metrics. Uh, we looked at the total cover of all plant species, native and non-native cover, species richness, the simply the count of species, and then the, the identity of the species that were present. These are, this is a map here of, um, not all of this misses our Goose Point site, but this is a map of our um, vegetation plots. These were generated uh, in GIS and kind of randomly distributed across all of these zones. And I'll just show you some of the vegetation results. The first one is total plant cover. So prior to um, restoration, cover was very high. It was about 100%. Um, in both reference wetlands and at SFC, although the, the types of species present were actually quite different. Following restoration, um, plant cover actually decreased across much of SFC. So again, this figure kind of shows you the uh, change in plant cover uh, between pre and post restoration periods. So these two reference wetlands tended to not change very much, but our zones at SFC uh, tended to lose a substantial part of their cover, even up to 50% of their plant cover um, was uh, removed during uh, early restoration. And this last, uh, this loss of plant cover was likely due to that salinity increase and even the pH changes that we saw in the soils. Um, the kinds of plants that were present at SFC were freshwater species for the most part and uh, didn't really handle that increase in salinity all that well. Um, another thing we looked at was the cover of the non-native species. So one of the species that was uh, very prevalent at um, SFC before the restoration is reed canary grass. So this is an invasive species, not very desirable, um, but it's quite common across the Pacific Northwest. Um, and we found that native, um, non-native species like reed canary grass um, actually declined more than native species at SFC. So it looks like the restoration of tidal influence helped knock back that species. And you can see some of the dead vegetation here in this photo. This is uh, kind of old um, bits of uh, reed canary grass that are now being replaced by native species. So as I mentioned, the plant composition was pretty different between these different zones. So our reference low marsh tended to be dominated by this plant here. This is Carex lingbii. This is a native species. Um, it's quite common in Pacific Northwest estuaries. Uh, kind of forms these uh, meadows that die back in the winter. And then the high marsh, our reference high marsh was actually a pretty diverse assemblage of different kinds of mostly native and some non-native species. So we have tufted hair grass here. We have a rush. Um, we have this Pacific silverweed. And then we have um, other species that kind of form a pretty diverse assemblage. And then as I mentioned at SFC, we tended to have a lot of dominance of this reed canary grass just prior uh, to restoration. Another thing we looked at was plant diversity. So the total number of, of species that we found in these different zones. And what I'm showing here, these are called um, species accumulation curves. They look kind of like uh, bananas. Um, and they show um, your species richness, so how many uh, species you have in your sample. Um, and that's a, a function of the number of plots that you sample. So you can imagine as you sample more and more plots, you're going to pick up rare species um, that you don't um, see commonly. And that's what these um, bananas kind of illustrate that they start to kind of flatten out because after you sample many, many, many plots, you're going to you're going to even catch all the rare species. Um, the higher or the, the taller the banana, basically the higher the diversity of the wetland. And for each of these, I'm showing the, the post restoration data in um, in color and the pre restoration data in gray. So this low, our low marsh didn't really change very much. 
Our high marsh seemed to have a little bit more diversity in the post restoration, and this actually might be due to having uh, two different sets of teams assess diversity. So it isn't quite clear if this is a real change over time or more of a methodological thing. We did find that um, pre-restoration that some of the, the um, uh, SFC zones were low in diversity. So our north zone tended to be kind of low, and then our crop zone in particular tended to be kind of low. But diversity appeared um, to increase um, following restoration. Another thing we did with um, uh, the vegetation at the site is we mapped it. And uh, this is the work of Laura Brophy, who um, went out and uh, used aerial images as well as uh, walked throughout the site to map the pattern of vegetation at the site. So I won't go into all the details here, but you can see these colors represent different types of plant communities. Uh, and these can be mapped out and um, the change um, in these communities can be assessed over time. One that I will point out is are these brown zones. So these dark brown areas, these are all bare ground areas that were, you know, they might have had a few plants in them, but they were essentially bare ground in 2018. So you can see that this crop zone in particular, kind of the whole southern part of the site, really had a lot of bare ground right after uh, restoration. That saltier water was coming in and it was really removing a lot of the freshwater plants that were present prior to restoration. This is just a few more pictures of vegetation change. Um, when that reed canary grass started to die back, um, it left a lot of open ground. And we saw a lot of colonization by algae and native plant species. So this is an interesting alga. Um, sometimes it's common, but um, it was really surprising just to see how common it was at SFC. It kind of looks like moss. It is an alga um, and not a true moss, but it grows here on the sediment surface. It actually is really important because it helps stabilize the soil and it can help trap seeds from plants, for instance, and help those plants germinate. We saw lots of this at S SFC. And then here's a picture of a few native species that are coming in. Um, we have the Pacific silverweed. We have a little bit of a non-native called cochula here or brass buttons that's come in as well. These are a couple more pictures. Uh, this is, these are just from a few months ago. So we did most of our vegetation work in 2018. So that was two years after restoration. Um, but I had a little bit of uh, additional time. So I went out this summer and was able to um, look at vegetation in most of the original plots. So this is the four year mark after restoration. And this is interesting because a lot of that bare ground is actually no longer bare ground. So another two years later, and we have a lot of recruitment of different species that are coming in. This is mostly that non-native brass buttons, but there are meadows of this native um, uh, Lingby sedge here, and then we have tufted hair grass, another native species that's kind of this golden color in the background. Another interesting plant that came in is this one. Um, this is called uh, golden dock or uh, Rumex marinimus, and this is a native species. It's not one that I have seen very often in Pacific Northwest wetlands, so it was actually surprising to see quite a few of this interesting native species coming in uh, last summer. Now the vegetation change at SFC did differ among these different zones. So I mentioned that low elevation crop zone on the south side, it quickly transitioned to a lot of bare ground, um, became fairly salty. But the north zone, which is fresher and higher in elevation, it actually was retaining a lot of its reed canary grass. So this is a large patch of reed canary grass that has persisted um, four years following restoration. So there may be some management implications about thinking about, um, you know, what to do in this zone and, and if, if, um, if it's desirable to remove that reed canary grass. This is just a little conceptual model of kind of that we've kind of put together based on the data that we've collected as well as um, results from other restoration projects throughout the Pacific Northwest. So it's kind of a conceptual model where um, prior this is our former tidal wetland that um, has altered hydrology. We may have a lot of non-native species like reed canary grass. And then soon after dike removal, if the conditions are salty enough, we can get uh, dieback of that vegetation, colonization of algae and, and plants, 
will then transition to a low marsh that might be dominated by this Lingby sedge. And then eventually it may take several decades, but as the site uh, creates sediment, we will get um, a mature high marsh. So we've already observed um, a number of steps along this pathway, um, but it will certainly be interesting to kind of keep monitoring this site to see how these native high marsh species come in. All right, so I'm going to talk a little bit about the fish results. Uh, I'm not a fish biologist, and so I don't know if Stan is on the call. He can correct me <laughs> if I uh, mess up uh, any of the fish data. Um, it's not my area of expertise, but this was a major goal to look at fish abundance and behavior um, in the channels um, in this project before and after restoration. So these were the areas that Stan's team uh, monitored. Uh, the blue ones are um, reference channels. So these are areas outside of uh, the SFC project. So we have, uh, Stan had some on the Wilson River and then some on the Trask River here. And then these red areas, these are sections of channels within SFC that were monitored for fish abundance. Um, the method that Stan's team used was uh, seining. So they um, uh, typically at uh, uh, anywhere from a low tide to a high tide, depending um, on the location, uh, visited the site. They had a net where they swept a known area of um, the creek, collected all the fish, and then enumerated um, the species that were present. So here's some of the results. And one of the um, uh, groups of fish of most interest are the Salmonids. These are, of course, an iconic species for the Pacific North Northwest. Uh, they've been in decline for decades. Um, and uh, part of that decline may be due to their uh, habitat loss in, in Pacific Northwest estuaries. So this first slide shows uh, juvenile Chinook salmon catches um, and uh, their condition pre and post. So the this and the next couple figures are kind of laid out the same. This is um, on the y-axis is mean count or catch per unit effort. And um, on the left side, we have the pre-restoration abundance. On the right is the post-restoration abundance. And then SFC is in the circles and the reference channels are in um, the triangles. So the reference channel is actually uh, Chinook decline. There, of course, can be year-to-year -year variability in catches. So this could be um, a totally natural fluctuation. But even though the reference uh, channels declined in abundance, the restored sites actually increased several fold in abundance. So it looks like um, for juvenile Chinook that the um, restoration of tidal hydrology into the site was actually beneficial for these young fish. There was um, a similar thing for uh, juvenile chum. So these salmon here, this is a, a picture of some of the uh, fish that Stan caught. Um, and these similarly, so the reference um, abundance of chum was relatively unchanged between pre and post restoration periods, but there was about a six fold increase in the amount of uh, juvenile chum that were caught in SFC channels after restoration. And then a third salmonid species that Stan's team uh, looked at were um, uh, juvenile coho, so age zero coho. Um, they did not um, tend to show market differences in their use. So um, at reference sites, uh, their abundance seemed to have increased between 2014 and 2018, but it was a fairly similar rate of increase um, at SFC as well. But the good news for this is that these coho salmon are using SFC. So these numbers are actually higher than the catches um, in the reference channel. So we know that these fish are, are using the habitats in this new wetland. Uh, and then I just included a, a couple of other species. These are not necessarily com commercially important species, but uh, lots of other species use tidal channels in estuarine wetlands. So staghorn sculpin, for example, can be quite abundant. Um, they were found at SFC before and after restoration, and actually it looks like their abundance increased. And then um, this species, um, shiner surf perch, um, also was found in both reference and SFC wetlands, although um, did tend to be more abundant in the, um, in the reference channels. 
So um, that's a lot of different parameters that we've kind of gone over. I want to give you just a, a summary of our findings in, in a couple additional slides. So overall, we've found that restoring tidal hydrology to SFC led to pretty rapid changes in groundwater hydrology, soil characteristics, as well as the vegetation that was present. Um, restoring that salinity, so increasing the salinity of the site um, in the channels is, and the groundwater and, and the pore water appeared to be an important driver of, of changes in the vegetation communities. Two years after restoration, the project still had relatively high cover of non-native species, but we definitely see native plants that are recruiting and coming into the site. And four years after restoration, um, their abundance seems to have increased pretty substantially. One of our hypotheses was that the, the rate of recovery of this wetland would vary by these different land cover land use zones. And we think that that hypothesis was pretty well confirmed by the data. So we found that there were differences in elevation, differences in pH, differences in plant communities among these different zones. And the areas that were lower, like this crop zone, for example, they tended to show an even more dramatic change in the first two years after restoration. So um, as SFC continues um, to develop, we expect um, that it's going to uh, support a lot of the important ecosystem services and functions um, in Tillamook Bay. There's a potential in the site for carbon sequestration. So as those soils are accreting at rates of five or maybe even 10 millimeters per year, they're trapping a lot of carbon in, in the soils as well. And the data um, so far suggests that salmonids and other fish species are utilizing uh, those channels, those tidal channels at SFC. Um, the project is large and so this additional habitat area, as well as all the food that this new wetland is providing, may be beneficial in the long run to salmonid populations um, in the broader estuary. Um, working through this project, we have a number of um, monitoring recommendations going forward. Um, we recommend additional periodic monitoring of the site. Uh, we did a lot of intensive sampling, but it is a relatively small um, window of time that we were able to look at. And so monitoring this project 5, 10, 20 years down the road is going to be very important. Um, there are a lot of whale and restoration projects in the Pacific Northwest, but uh, long-term monitoring sort of beyond the 10-year mark is actually fa fairly low. Um, and so uh, this is an important opportunity to look at the long-term change of this, of this project. And we, look, we looked a lot at um, kind of structural me metrics of these wetlands, but it's also important to look at processes. So um, it's important to monitor how the project may be um, protecting against flooding. Um, it's important to look at um, fish production as well as um, fish food webs. And I think um, more data are needed on carbon sequestration and greenhouse gas emissions. So how does this um, project look from a carbon perspective uh, a decade or two after restoration. So with that, I'd just like to acknowledge um, a really big team. I probably forgot some people on this slide, but a lot of people helped um, do the sampling in this project um, at a variety of institutions, uh, particularly the Institute for Applied Ecology and uh, the Tillamook Estuaries Partnership. Uh, we want to thank the local landowners, um, including the county and Greg Hublow, who provided access to the land so we could sample. And we were funded by a number of different grants over the years. Um, NOAA, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, and OWEB all helped uh, fund the, the monitoring in this project. So that is it for the presentation, but um, I'd be happy to address any questions. and. I guess I'll turn that over to you, Alex. You can moderate that. <laughs> yeah, thank you so much, Chris. That was a fantastic um, presentation. And um, we really appreciate, appreciate you taking the time to present to us this evening. And if you, I think the easiest way to do the Q&A will be if you stop screen sharing so I okay. can see the folks. Um, on the larger screen.
Let's see here. I might. Mm -hmm. Oh, there we go. Um, did I have a bar across the, the bottom the whole time yeah. of my slide? Yeah. Okay, because it was showing for me the whole time. <laughs> and I was wondering if everyone else saw that. <laughs> so I'm glad no, it was. <laughs> I don't think so. Uh, oh, wow, we have such a large group. So I'm going to do my best to um, go. Actually, you know, I know there's some TEP folks on here, maybe too. So if I could get help from a TEP, another TEP person to maybe monitor more questions as well. Um, we should be able to see folks. So there is a way, I think if you click, you should be able to, um, under the reactions, either, well, they don't have the raise the hand option, do they? Um, so if you have your video on and you have a question that you'd like to ask, if you wanna raise your hand so we can see you and I'll try and call on folks as I see hands raised. If you do not have your video on, if you go down to the reactions, and give us like a thumbs up, just like that, um, like like Deborah's doing too over in the TEP box. Um, we'll be able to see that you have a question for us, and um, I'll kind of go back and forth between these two videos screens, um, and we can also post it into the. Um, I've seen a few questions in the chat too, so we can get to those as well. Um, let's see. And I think, let's see, the, the question that I've gotten twice so far um, has been about flooding in Tillamook. Um, so Chris, I don't know if you want to address the um, flooding research that's been done or if you want me to give kind of a wrap on what we've found so far um, in regards to flooding in the city of Tillamook in the highway corridor there. Sure, I'll, do, I'll give it a quick stab and then you're welcome to um, fill in what I um, <laughs> what I missed. So um, that part of the project was really done by the um, Northwest Hydraulic Consultants, so a group out of Seattle. And they um, did some modeling work of, uh, with implementation of the project, what would be the reduction in height of floods that would occur kind of in the lower Tillamook Bay area. And I believe that their model showed about a 10 inch reduction overall for sort of a typical flood. Um, yeah, I don't live in Tillamook, so you guys can correct me if, if I'm wrong, but I don't think there have been a lot of major storms in the last four years that have really um, kind of been a great opportunity to test that reduction. But the modeling does suggest that, that the project is leading to flood reduction. Mm -hmm. Yes, so we did have a, a what's kind of more of a nuisance flood occur, um, so a smaller, it was a a five-year flood event um, occur sh right after the project construction was completed in October 2017. And it was the earliest flood on record on the Wilson River. So this gave us this, we did um, have Northwest Hydraulics consultants do an analysis and redo their modeling efforts based on the flood event. And what they did find was that um, between the Hocourt and Slough, and I have some graphic information pulled up on my phone, so that's why I'm looking down. Um, but in that Highway 101 corridor, they did find that um, the flood levels were reduced between six and nine inches. And that was especially um, the egg lands behind the hospital experienced a, um, that about nine inch um, flood reduction, almost a foot of flood reduction in that area. Um, what they also found was that the flood duration was significantly reduced. So um, it took about uh, one to two hours longer for the highway to flood and it was evacuated an hour, um, about two hours faster. So that reduced the amount of time that that highway was closed. And then overall, they saw a flood reduction um, across about 4,800 acres during that flooding event. Um, and I think during higher flood events, they are expected to see even more reductions in those areas. Um, but in order for us to really get a good idea of how this project has affected flooding, we need to experience some larger floods and we don't actually want that to happen. <laughs> so while we are, um, we recognize that one is probably going to eventually come. And when it does, we have plans to again, do the monitoring and look at the flood levels and come out with some information about um, how it was reduced. Mm -hmm. 
So another question here in the comments is, do we have a sense of how much funding it would cost to do a monitoring survey 5, 10, or 15 years out? Yeah, well, that, that cost will be driven a lot by the number of parameters that um, are monitored. Some are more expensive than others. Um, for example, the hydrology monitoring can be pretty um, time intensive as well as, you know, requires a lot of pressure sensors and so forth. Um, the vegetation sampling is that's uh, that's mainly a labor issue. Um, so I'll give a very broad range. Um, let's say we wanted to monitor the project, um, you know, a decade out from the restoration um, to look at, you know, a very basic set of parameters like soils and um, uh, plants and fish, you know, maybe $150,000, $200,000 to kind of uh, have a team go in and, and look at that. Um, that cost would, would go higher um, if we wanted to look at a number of other um, uh, parameters. It sounds like a lot of money, but um, monitoring funds are actually usually just a pretty small fraction of the cost of implementing the project. Um, a number of these large restoration projects, you know, cost five, ten million dollars to implement. So the monitoring costs, um, you know, they're not trivial, but they, they're not nearly as large as the actual project costs. And the, just for reference, the, the total cost of the Southern Flow Corridor restoration was about eleven million dollars. So that two hundred to thousand dollar for post-restoration monitoring is, is pretty small. Um, the only issue that we really do find is that monitoring is a hard thing to fund a lot of the time. So, it can be sometimes, yeah. <laughs> so we are um, actively looking at, now that, that some of this data and information is coming out, um, that we're looking into the next round of, of how we will pursue additional monitoring in the future. So um, Tillamook Estuaries Partnership is, is helping to take a lead on looking into the monitoring efforts too, and, and we'll be seeking funding for those um, on behalf of, of helping the monitoring team go forward. Uh, and similarly with outreach, we'll be continuing to do um, outreach around what we see happening out at the Southern Flow Corridor. Um, I have had a request for a similar presentation about the flood modeling efforts. So we'll be looking um, to try and do one of those here next year. Um, so we hope you'll join us for that and we'll be able to really share some of the results that have been seen out on the site when it comes to flooding. Do we have any more questions for Chris? I'm not seeing any hands risen or thumbs up from folks without cameras on right now. <laughs> Well, if you do happen to come up with any questions, um, you can go, I'm going to type my email address here into the chat and you can send them to me and I can pass them along to Chris. Um, and oops, I didn't, I accidentally sent that to a single person. There we go. So that is um, Alex, A-L-I-X at T-V-N-E-P dot org is my email address. So if you want to forward me any questions that you might have following up the presentation, um, I'll be happy to share those with Chris and can get those out to you. Um, we did also record this presentation. So um, if you want to look, if you joined us late or if you want to look back at it, I'll be sending a recording out to everyone that registered it because there's quite a few people that registered and weren't able to participate as well. Um, and we'll be making it available for folks that do want to watch it. So. Thank you. And I'll just mention if anyone would like a copy of the slides, I'm happy to provide a, a PDF if, if you give me an email. So, mm -hmm. and I'll add my email here as well. Thank you. Great. All right. Well, thank you everyone so much for joining us this evening. I hope you enjoyed this presentation and I hope you'll keep an eye out for more information about Southern Flow Corridor coming out as we continue to do outreach um, around the different efforts there and for any of the other work that Tillamook Estuaries Partnership and our partners are working on right now. Have a fantastic evening, everybody. All right, thank you. <laughs> nice to see everyone. <laughs>